Okay. It's your turn, Veronique. Are you ready for the second talk of the night? I'm ready. Yeah, we have ten, uh, ten more others just after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> take this one. Oh, I prefer red. You prefer red? Uh, but, it's but here it's, it's even very uh. good like that. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll take blue then. No, because of the white. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome for the second talk of this evening um, of Type Paris. Again, uh, I want to say that I'm very happy to be here and thank very much Jean Francois and all the team of Type Paris uh, for letting me introduce the lectures tonight. Um, uh, I'm especially happy, I must say, to introduce tonight uh, Morag. Myerskov. <laughs> uh, Morag is, uh, was born in London, um, where she works and lives. Uh, she studied at the Central St. Martins and at the Royal College of Art uh, in uh, London. Uh, she has a strong visual approach um, in her work and creations. Her topics deal with architecture, urban environment, um, using lettering, color, patterns, but above all, the, um, the, the thing that she's concerned about is people uh, and how uh, creation can make people happy. Uh, she's also concerned about belonging, that's something she's talking uh, all around the world about. That's another way, uh, in fact, to pay attention to uh, people who work, who sh who sorry, people she works with um, in her project. And for example, she's very often trying to organize uh, workshops with uh, future um, uh, users or audience uh, for her of her of her installations or creations. There is something I really liked when I read uh, about her work uh, and that she said. It's, uh, she says that changing people's perceptions uh, of spaces into places, and that's probably something she will talk about uh, tonight. She has worked for many different uh, commissioners like hospitals, cultural hubs, town centers and buildings. She's creating images, but not only, also installations, wall paintings, and also she's also a textile designer, and she's also designing uh, objects. Of course, her work is based on color, patterns, and as far as she's here tonight, she's also using typography. But she's saying that she doesn't use typography um, as a constraint uh, rules, but more on an intuitive and creative way. That's what we'll see. I want to mention that uh, she was, she's among the 50 creative leaders selected by Creative Review in 2008 2018, sorry, <laughs> and eight, yes, 18, this year, yeah, yeah sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, she's also one of the top 10, top 10 influential uh, women designer uh, of the last 20 years. <laughs> yes, please welcome warmly. Morag, <laughs> we're so happy to have you tonight. So, can I start mine now? Is that a, is a thing, man? Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for having me, and I feel a little bit embarrassed to be among such an amazing lot of typographers and... Um, and possibly, uh, well, I, you know, well, you'll make your judgment about what I do by the end of it, I hope. 
But um, I've been working for a really long time, and um, I did this piece in um, 1993 in London. And don't worry, we're not going to go from 1993. We're going to jump. We're not like you're not going to have everything I've ever done. Um, and and at the time, and this is how you can see how things have changed. Um, at the time, this was going to be pulled down because it was too colourful and too bold. And it was in all the papers and everything, but it, it stayed up. So now I can't do anything. Everything I do, I have to do more colourful and more bold. So, um, so I have um, had a long career and, um, and I've worked for a long time with architects integrating my, uh, well, am I allowed to say typography? I'm not sure. Anyway, integrating... <laughs> <laughs> letters and words into buildings and this was a brilliant piece actually it was up for the Sterling Award for Architecture in 2007 where the architect had actually designed the building so that I could put my work into it so that was that was quite integrated and then this one you may have been to the Barbican this uh, signage I worked with Cartledge Levine on this and this project was a disaster for years and years and they they said to us, do you want to take on the poison chalice? And, um, and we did it, and it's still there since 2007. And I think what's interesting about um, when you do work, you never, ever know whether it's going to turn out right or not. But if it's there and it stays there, then that proves that you've actually made it work. So, the, so these are just a lead up to um, things where I started. Basically, I had an issue with working with page sizes, A2, A3, A4, all that sort of stuff. And I also had an issue with printing where you might be, due to cost and everything, limited to two colour, four colour. I usually like working with like 18 colours and that didn't really go down very well with people. So, um, and I'd gone to see lots of artworks, like you mentioned Jenny Holtz and Lon Sweeney and things like that. And I used to go to those places and just think, I want to just do really big things. I just want to get my work out off a piece of paper and into spaces. And this was for London College Communications, their summer show. And it, we all, we just hand, I got some students to help me and we hand painted it outside. And then obviously I like to get things on everything. These are my um, ridiculous stools. They're just silly words on stools. And I sprayed those. And then this, um, I, I, I would design lots of exhibitions and, um, and I got, when I got this exhibition in 2010, I thought this is it, I've made it, it's my life. And I, I was given the permanent exhibition at the design museum. But weirdly, nobody actually realizes I designed the whole of the stuff behind. They actually only think I did that, but that's okay. And um, I worked on that project for six years and uh, it did nearly kill me and I don't mind if that's recorded. Um, and this was, I had this idea, this is a tri wall, you know, just an outside advertising wall. I had this idea from really, really early on. I had to go through loads of iterations. I do not like the word iteration. And I came back, I managed to, in the end, convince them to do what I wanted in the first place. So, I, I, at least I won. And so this is, um, this is permanent, because a lot of my work is temporary, and this is permanent, and now has become sort of iconic within the building, because the picture that everybody takes is that and that. So I feel quite proud about that. It says, designer, user, maker. So at the same time, in 2012, I was offered this project, so it's a bit blurred. I was just given this site. It was a meanwhile space. It was just before the Olympics. And I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> and then I came to this um, site that day, and the guy who asked me to do this project basically told me if I didn't do it, I would lose a job. So I went home. And I thought, well, God, I better get... That makes you start thinking quickly, doesn't it? So I thought, oh, God, I better do something. And I've been working with the poet Lem Cizé on the project on a different piece. Um, he, he was doing a permanent piece of type of... Uh, permanent poem. I was doing the type for it. Um, and then... He, but he used to tweet every day, and I used to tweet colours. Um, and then I thought I'd look at his tweet, and I'd look to the tweet that day, and this, this just said something to me. It was about people 
I don't know, it was about people missing people, people seeing things, eye contact, all sorts of things. And I just took those words and I just went like crazy and made this model. And by the end of the evening, I thought, oh yeah, that's okay, I like that. And I never really made a little building before. I'd never done anything. And, and I just knew that it was right. And I took it. So next morning, I was so excited. And I sent it over to... I didn't even go in myself. I just sent it over to the guy because he was quite grumpy and was a bit fed up with me. And um, they said, yeah, you can, you can build it. And then I had three weeks to build it. I've never built a build it, you know, I've never built something like that before. I built... I know how to build. I know how to build exhibitions and things like that. Um, and my dog was quite fed up by the end of it. Um, so I asked a few people. At the time, I had one or two assistants. I don't have any assistants anymore. I just employ people to come and paint with me. But at that time, I had some assistants. And I said to them, you're going to paint this with me? And they said, yeah, OK. And then we just painted the whole thing. So I think there was me and three others. Um, and then this is the final piece. Um, and that's the M going up. And what I think is always so amazing is in the studio, the M looked really, really huge. And you'll probably know that, but the moment you take words outside into the environment, and they shrink, like shrink to little. So you're making something might be as big as this room and you put it three feet up, three meters up, four meters up, and it's like that big. And so that's, so when people come around and they go, why is everything so huge more? It's like, because it's in my house. It's not out in the street. So, um, so this was the piece. And this, we, this went out to the press. And this just sort of caused a big, um, sort of, there were loads of awards and people hadn't seen something like it before. And um, it just started a whole thing that was very exciting. And I can't just do the building. I had to make all the stools. And there were, some, um, there were words from Lem Cizé as well. And then I had to make the cushions. So I, I used to sew, but I hadn't sewn for years. So I got me and the other Lizzie and um, Catherine, we just sat and made these cushions in the studio. And then this is the final piece. So it's really complex. It was made of shipping containers. We had to uh, carve out this space. Um, anyway, that, that's it. So this led on, somebody had seen that, then I was asked to do a piece in a library and I worked with young people to get, this was a brand new library, you might know, it's a Meccano, by Meccano in Birmingham and they'd knocked down a, an old Brutalist library and they put this new library and they wanted people to understand what libraries were about in the future and these were the words by the young people and then I painted them and then we put this, the architects were, weren't that happy <laughs> because that was the best view through there but I never told them to put it there um, so you, you're meant to view through and view up and my thing was there for the first three months <laughs> oh well and um, so we made this workshop that then um, people took over uh, this was one workshop I did but I thought the pe when the people took the workshop over, it was so much better than how I made my workshop. My workshop was really controlled, and then they just filled the inside, and it was really exciting. So I, I like making things that you can just give to people. Um, the reason I'm showing this is because this is how basic my sketches are. I'm not actually terribly good at drawing, as you might, be, you might see. And I used to really, really be embarrassed about my drawing because my sister's a fine artist and my mum can draw and everybody can draw. And maybe I can draw if I tried a bit harder. But, um, but actually, I've learned to love my drawing because I think that it expresses... Because when I do it, when I've seen it at the end of it, you might not know what's going to end up. <laughs> But I know how I can take it further. So then I, we would make a model. And then this was... Uh, this. So there's lots of themes that are carry on through the work and they reappear. And depending on the project, this was an art project up in Wakefield. Depending on the project, different elements come back. So this one was about using swings to move the words. I worked, we wrote poems with the, with a young group of people in Wakefield and then the word, the swings move and the words move and then we've got wind and it, and it was, 
people didn't really like the noise. I thought it sounded like a shipyard, but some people didn't like that. But I liked it. But I actually had never thought it would make a lot of noise. So that's the thing you learn. And then you can make more of it the next time. I'm afraid there aren't many peach people or pictures with people in it in this, in this context, because um, I didn't manage to get any. But anyway, they swing um, and they move. So you can see that I quite like the same font all the way through. And when I was at the Royal College, I decided that I was only ever going to use Franklin Gothic condensed for the rest of my life. And then I thought that that was maybe being a bit limited. Um, and I did use loads of other fonts in between. But actually, I almost have come back to Franklin Gothic. Oh, it's of an ilk. I used a condensed Gothic type font majority of the time with shadows and things. And then just this summer, uh, we went to design in Darba, and so you can see these swings have been, they're different swings, um, but they're built into the, much more into the structure. And, and this was the piece uh, in Indarba, you just go up and you walk around. It was a massive piece in the middle of, it's in Cape Town, sorry, um, in the middle of the square. And it was just for people to play on. And this one was called Embrace the Unknown. So I like calling the projects names. God, I can't actually remember when I started. That was what I was going to do, so I don't go run over. Oh, well, tell me to shut up when, when I've gone on too long. That's fine. So this is the piece. Um, and um, so it's interactive, and then you can climb on it. And, and then I also got young, um, some young people in Africa to do me some patterns, and then I translate them. So what I think is really important, and I'll talk to you about Sister Carita um, later, a project, if you know about Sister Carita, oh, well, no, you're not meant to call her Sister Carita, Carita Kent. Carita Kent, an American nun, she was a nun, artist and educator. Um, I did a project with her later, but I realized that there were so many similarities that I hadn't ever known about. Um, but there is this thing about looking and seeing. It's not, uh, it's not uh, anything particularly new um, or anything, but it is just a thing that you really do need to think about quite a lot. And about really, when you see, you really start understanding things. And when you go to places, and Carita Kent writes that, you know, you should always see things like a child for the first time, and I, I really believe in that as well. And, and also, I... I see, you know, I don't really like the fronts of um, advertising thing, advertising, whatever they're called, um, but I like the backs, and I like scaffolding, and this is in Myanmar. So I collect pictures of these things, and I, I really look into them and think about their, how they're used or how they could be used in a different way as well. But these are just all things that make me just so happy. <laughs> in Melbourne. I'd only ever seen it in pictures before and then I finally went to see it and it was as good as I thought it was going to be. It made my day. And this, I just, this is from a long time ago when I went to Delhi and I think it's 2008 but I always show this picture because I think that is such brilliant branding. It's amazing. Not one of those are the same, are they? I, but the colour brings it together and the type brings it together so it is unified but it's not in a controlled modernist manner um and these are just i i and I, I, and also i think sometimes you look and you don't see but it goes in your head and then sometimes you can see it comes back to you and then you you think about it and you see it in a different way and this is just amazing. These are in Myanmar. I went to Myanmar just when they let people come in a few years ago, four or five years ago. And they are actually kids' chairs they're sitting on. So when those people leave, the chairs were all just like tiny little kiddies' chairs. I just think that's such a sort of surreal thing. And then just these beautiful, beautiful colours get against the uh, earth colours of the architecture. And then if you go in a car in... In Delhi, that's all you see all the time. 
And then, and this is one of my older suitcases, but this is my suitcase I took to Croatia when I went and did a talk recently. And so I collect all my, every time I travel, except this time because I only go in tomorrow morning, so I've only just got a rucksack, um, I take a picture of my suitcase and then I just keep those and then one day I'll do something with it. So to continue the seeing, the looking and the seeing thing, um, I've always loved um, things from Mexico, but I'd never been to Mexico. And some British Council people came to my studio and I said, oh God, I want to go to South America. And fortunately, there were people there in South America. And then about three months later, they rang me and they said, Morag, we do this design festival. These people are absolutely amazing. If you're ever in Mexico in September, or, or se late September, is there a date on there? Anyway, yeah, October. If you ever in, go to, the, to see this um, design festival. And they just said, Morag, we want you to make a big installation and we'll give you a choice of squares. And they gave me this two choices. One was um, a really beautiful green square. And one was this one, you see, which is Zocala Square, which I don't, didn't know anything about Zocala Square. And, obviously, and I went, well, I want that one. And they're like, are you sure? And I said, yeah, that one. And then they went, oh, OK. So that's the most famous square in Mexico. <laughs> and that, the um, flag goes up and down every day. And, um, and it's just like everything is just full of life. And this road looks right into the square. So I was introduced this book, Ways of Seeing. I don't know what it's on about. I never understood it. But I really like the cover. And I love the title of it. And also, when I was really young, I watched this film. Oh, it's upside down. <laughs> Dr. Easy's residence. Down. Oh, good morning, Miss June. Yes, <laughs> Sorry. indeed. The doctor's up in his thing, you know, his camera obscura. He's got his new lens from the shop this morning and it makes a lovely picture. Anyway, He's so taken the big white garden cable to death project on. You'll be glad you're coming I over. He's it. showing it to the dogs now. Ah, nice day. Hmm, Mrs. Bidwell's ducks out too early. She'll lose all the eggs if she's not careful. Ah, the start of the cycling season. There's a hefty young girl. Time Mrs. Tucker went to get our rations. So is that, this is upside down. Um, I'll move it on. But because when I was a child, I used to work, watch a lot of television. It was new then, you know, so it was exciting. <laughs> and, um, and you weren't really meant to watch it. So I would watch it as much as I possibly could. So I watched all these films and stuff all the time. So, we, so from that, I just thought, why don't we do build this camera obscura? Because they asked us to do something that was about being iterative and I wanted to do something about um, how it was about ha how designers work or artists work and I wanted to say it was about having a feeling or going to see things or seeing things in a different way so we wanted to make a camera obscura like that one I've shown you but that has a lens and we couldn't get one in Mexico so um, we just used a whole a pinhole camera and these were some of the sketches. So this is what we wanted, but that is what we did. Um, and then the mirror event, look and see. And then this was the final piece. We, this was nothing, this was fencing going on behind, nothing to do with me. And this was a road that, there's a road off here that stretches right through the whole of Mexico City and this was right at the very end of it. So people would come inside They'd queue, I don't think they knew what they were queuing for, and then they'd go into the camera obscura and they would be explained what it was all about. But I just love things like this, building these things, the juxtapositions against the architecture. And this is actually, this is the whole, <laughs> and this is what you saw. And what I thought was so amazing about it is that people didn't realize that through a hole, <laughs> you got a video that was upside down, it was color, didn't have sound, but, um, and, and you know, and people learnt things and I thought that was fantastic and they did go out seeing it in a different way. So, um, and then this was a piece I just did recently. I don't do many internal pieces and obviously that didn't go anywhere afterwards because it was six metres high. So I was asked to do this piece for the other art fair and I just built this piece from old bits of my old installations. So I keep the installations and rebuild them. And then I, I, re I did the type new for it. 
So this one, this is like, if I die now, which ho hopefully I don't, but if I do, maybe somebody can try and resuscitate me, but if I do die now, um, I, I'm okay because I built this project. I didn't know that until I built it and now I feel like, because I have been really frustrated for many years about expressing myself and what I wanted to do. And then finally when I built this project, um, I feel that's okay now, that's okay. So um, I was asked, um, it's a, it was a love festival on the South Bank on, in London, and they said originally they were doing the seven, um, seven types of love from Greek mythology, and I was originally given storge, um, but that was a love of a mother to a child, but I don't have children, and so I, it was only one-sided for me, and I was like, I tried it, but it didn't really quite work for me. And we did do a presentation, but they realized, they liked our presentation, but they thought, no, actually, what we're going to do is give you the Temple of Agape. So then they gave us a new project, the Temple of Agape, which was much better for me because it was about love for everybody. It wasn't about religion. It was just about love. And, this, and they gave me this quote. I could use one word from the quote, or I could use whatever I wanted. So I took the quote, but before I took the quote, in the back of my brain, I remember when I was in Mexico and they were building, no, in Delhi, and they were building these flyovers. And at the time in London, they were getting rid of the flyovers. And they had, so the flyover was then put next to this existing old monkey temple. And I just really loved that juxtaposition. And in um, South Bank, it's a concrete building, and I was going to bring this color into the space. So there are all these embedded thoughts that come out that you don't really know. And I was on a train, and this wasn't out of desperation. I was just on the train, and it came to me. <laughs> and, and I just drew this, um, the, the temple. I just drew it. And I just sat on the train for three hours, and I drew the temple. And then, I, again, I felt that was right. But I think about things for a really long time. I, you know, I'm not producing all the time. I, I have to lie down. I have to watch telly. I have to do things. And then suddenly, I'm <laughs> a little bit like that. Um, and then I made um, a paper model of it. And then they just said yes. So again, this was really, really fast. And the South Bank wanted, that was my old dog, Lemmy, the South Bank wanted me to do a call out for volunteers and I don't, personally, I don't, um, if people work for me on my other, on my projects, on, and I'd let, I did it for the South Bank but I always pay people because I don't think it's right but this was interesting, um, we got all these people in, different people every day, I was completely worn out, I had to teach everybody how to make everything, they could come for one day, they got their travel paid for, or they could come for three weeks, and they just came and they stayed, and we got new people, and then we'd make a picture every day of what we did, and, and it was actually really, really lovely, and everybody was part of the making. And then I had these scaffolders that were so great because, can you see them up there? Those two there, right? So I'm standing down there and they've got 306, uh, I think, no, 200, no, 138 words to put up with me going left a bit, right a bit. <laughs> and they did it. They were really, really wonderful and they did it because you can't measure it all. You have to do it all by eye. And then this was... So it was interesting, if you go back and I showed you the Watts Towers, there was a picture of the Watts Towers, I didn't say, but this was the scaffolding once all those panels had been put in and it was just really beautiful. Then I covered up with this, which I regret in a way because I planned that, but I liked that. So now I try and do that as well as that. And this is the final piece. And it was really very much about, on the outside it was a peacock and it was just colorful and telling you, you know, love. And then on the inside, and this was a walkway down, and people would walk through it, too many people. And then, because I, it was initially not connected to a staircase, but that was something I was asked to do. Um, and then, um, and in the inside, it was very, very natural, and it was about using the cutouts and the wood to get the light coming in. 
Okay, so making things together. This is a project from a few years ago, but I really love it, and it was my beginning of really working in hospitals. So I, w I worked again with Lem Sizé, who's an amazing poet, and he went in and worked with the young patients in the hospital, um, the Whitechapel Hospital, or the Royal London it's called, it's in Whitechapel. And then we took their words and then I did workshops. And when we work with children who are really ill, like that little girl was really suffering from cancer, you know, they have a lot of drugs and things, so they don't have a lot of patience. So you have to work really, really carefully with them. And, um, and, but, you know, we got great things and I found the words they loved the best and, and, they, and some really beautiful poems. So this piece was using, I made a, I'm not going to say a font, but I made some letters <laughs> with the kids' drawings and then used their poem that was really lovely about what walls are made of and they're made of laughter and it was sunshine. It was a really beautiful poem um, to cover their dining rooms. These are their dining rooms and then painted the chairs. And then this one was just so, such a lovely little seven-year-old boy who wrote half in Urdu and half in English. And, and then this one, <laughs> the nurses were a bit worried. Um, this was for two-year-olds or three-year-olds and they loved the word dazzle. So um, that's it. And, you know, and, and it's not, it, they're all still there and everybody loves it. So um, this is a project that didn't happen actually because of... Funny, I worked on this for nearly three years and I want to show it to you anyway because they made a mistake. Well, <laughs> I'm going to say that, but um, no, um, I got all the funding. I won, the, it was a competition, a public art competition. I won the funding, but there, in the end, there was one woman who didn't like pink and she stopped it. Um, so I did loads and loads of workshops with people with dementia and... Um, uh, young kids and cultural groups and these amazing ladies from I think Cyprus or Gre Gre Greece, one of the and um, and they gave me um, uh, lovely food that they'd made and you know it was they, it was really lovely and I I and this guy's piece of work he was in the daycare centre he I used that as the main motif. So I draw, I take their drawings, I, we use stickers and things, and then I, I make it into a pattern. But then I made these bigger pieces that took elements of everybody else's patterns to make a, a, a piece together. So the whole thing was, is that I come from this area, and, um, and it is, it's a very migratory area, and we went through, we were, I worked with like three poets and we didn't get any words and then in the end I just felt the word that meant the most to everybody who lives there is that we're together. So now, and there's a lot of together things at the moment, um, I think this was this two years ago, but started like three or four years ago. Um, and then this was the piece and we even went as far as sample, I do have this in my studio because it was really, really complex. I, I'm not going to bore you with it because I've got too much to talk about. <laughs> How much time have I got? Five minutes. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll rush through that. This is my only permanent piece of work, um, which I think permanent is hard, but when you've done enough temporary, you can do permanent. So I was asked to do this bridge in, uh, next to Battersea Power Station. It's the opening of the power station. And there was a festival. This, this, this festival, I wish I had been... I wasn't actually alive to see this, um, <laughs> but I wish I had been able to see this in its heyday. And then I made this piece. And again, uh, this is me, um, how I draw up the board, so that's just, and then these are the, this is a big type in the studio. So I think I've been talking too much, so I'm going to whiz to a bit that I want to talk about. <laughs> and that's the piece, and that's all hand-painted in our studio, and you can see it from, um, so you can see about using the contrast in the surrounding area. We just, you can just look at the pictures on this one. So this is a space, this is in Romania last year. This is, I'm, and then that's just with black lights because I use neon. And then this piece is in Las Vegas. Um, oh my God. Three weeks in Las Vegas. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, 
<laughs> was truly horrible. Um, so I had, uh, you, I had made this rug before, you can't quite see it, surrender to its warm embrace, and it was a phrase taken off a slumberland box. And then I was asked to do this piece on the front of a motel in, um, in Las Vegas. So this was the motel. But they seemed to think that I was going to put the scaffolding up as well, as well as paint it all. I was like, I'm too old, I can't do that. So, um, so they gave us this space behind, and then we had to build this sort of ad hoc studio, and then we painted the whole thing. And they said they'd give me volunteers, but they didn't because nobody in Las Vegas wants to paint outside. <laughs> they want to stuff um, pieces of paper in envelopes. And so, so majority, I did get, finally get two people who helped me, but I had to paint nearly the whole thing myself, and I nearly died. I had to lie down for three months because... That's me painting, because I, <laughs> I nearly died. It was even though in the shade, it was really, really hot. And then they kept on telling me, well, you can work all night, Moag, if you want. It's like, no, I've got to sleep. Let me sleep. <laughs> and then if you're ever there, you have to go to the neon, gra the neon graveyard. It is just the most amazing, amazing views. So this is the scaffolding, which I finally didn't have to put up. Um, and then I had my own vehicle my own cherry picker, but I said I wouldn't drive it, so I got them to get me a driver because I was being the queen. <laughs> and then we had to paint this wall super fast as well. And this was the piece. And then at night, uh, so you might know Panton, Pant uh, I can't remember his first name, but his work it was on the other side, and this is my work. And in downtown Las Vegas, this work just um, grows all the time all the so I this is right I'm gonna whiz through this have I got five minutes no, yes, yes. whiz through this whiz through this um, so um, we make belonging so I'm London born London bred and this is my clown grandfather who was English but went to the circus and lived it was in Paris in the permanent circus in Paris and this is my great-grandmother who was German and I think a bit French as well, and she was a high diver, and they couldn't find anything for her to do, so that's why she became a high diver. And I didn't really realize, I thought she went on a wire, but a high diver goes off here into a pond, into like a really small, that's not her, but I'd watched this film, and I was like going, oh my God, that's what my grandmother did. <laughs> it's like totally weird. they die um, but she did live and um, and they moved to Holloway to a very working class area and this was my French grandmother grandfather on the left and his son and he was a salon painter called Marx who lived in Paris but look what happened to the high diver I'm a bit nervous that I might <laughs> I might I might grow into her that's quite scary and is that a cat or a dog I don't know what that is um, <laughs> And this is my very elegant French grandmother who, in the house in Holloway, changed her house into a French salon because she wanted to escape from the horrible place that she was living in and got all her family in France to make her this thing. And she lived this very elegant life and, and desire, uh, helped make hats for Hartnell. And that's my dad. And that's my dad. And, and sadly, I have to admit, I cannot speak a word of French, even though they spoke French all the time, because my dad was quite hard on us um, about how we pronounce things. And, uh, and I don't play an instrument either. Um, OK, so this is me at the Royal College. And I liked, um, I liked the obvious. And the one at the end is Hockney Paints the Stage, which sort of blew my mind. And this was my work at the Royal College. Um, it, I did opera sets. So that's why I've sort of gone full circle. We'll skip Luke. <laughs> we'll skip Luke because that's too long. Um, and this is where I live now. And so this is what it's about. So now I live in this place. I came from a home that was crazy. I, I never really fit in around about accepting my home. I moved home. And then it took me and 20 years to be able to buy this um, house. Do I have to stop? Oh, two minutes. I've got two minutes. Okay, sorry, everybody. <laughs> I thought I planned this well. So this, what is so amazing about this house is I live and work in the house. So I can do whatever I like and then sometimes I have people helping me. And then, and then this year I managed to get do what I've 
wanted another one that I wanted to do. So I love bandstands and I love this top hat song. So we're at top hat when they're in the bandstand. Watch that. Um, and but look at the amazing and how they're free places and you can just gravitate round them and you don't have to pay to see anything and so okay so this is okay I totally misjudged it I did all my counting and I got all my things wrong this is Karita Kent anyway go and have a look at her work because she's amazing and I did a project Ditchling a museum were getting her work and they asked me is there anything um, and they said to me would you like to do something and I said well I've always wanted to do my bandstand and so now we're married together so um, we did so in the museum, there's what belonging means to me and what belonging means to Luke, but we haven't talked about Luke, but that's fine. And then I, um, I did a whole load of workshops. You must, everybody must read this book by Carita Kent, Learning by Heart is absolutely genius. It really makes you think. So loads of workshops with all age groups of community, six groups, for what they thought belonging was about. And then I, I worked up all their words, worked with Brighton University to help me paint the placards. I painted the rest of the it myself. That's my new puppy, Elvis. And then this is a piece. So the bandstand has all the people's messages. The whole thing about the bandstand, it's traveling all summer um, in East Sussex. And each time, um, in Sussex, each time they um, get it, their words, each time the community groups get it, their words come to the front. And this was in a really, in, a, in an estate. And it's already, everybody wants it back each year. It brought the community together. Yeah, and I'm, I'm so happy that it happened. So, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry, I went over. Sorry, sorry. No, no, sorry. no, 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 no. <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, I recommend you to go and see uh, Morag's Instagram account. Maybe you will be able to see a little bit, uh, many, many beautiful images about what she talked about and more. Do you have questions, guys? Yay. <coughs> uh, hi. hi. Thank you for that presentation. It was great. Thank you. Um, during the whole presentation, I was thinking there's a, an element of a circus in what you do. Mm. And then when you get to the <laughs> end, you find out that your, your family was from circus <laughs> upbringing. Yeah. And then you can see that all of the influences that you have sort of stem from that because there's your grandmother jumping from a scaffolding. Mm. So the scaffolding comes from there. And then the typography in the background <laughs> and everything. So it's really interesting because in several of the... Um, the uh, type talks we've had, the, the influence of a grandfather or a parent has been really determining. But I was thinking of some other influences that I see and that are very British to me. Okay. Um, like Sgt. Pepper or uh, Monty Python. And I was just wondering if those are also influences for you. There's something about British eccentricity that comes out. <laughs> yeah. So I was well. just wondering what your thoughts were about that. I did. I mean, my dad um, played on the Beatles album. He was a session musician. So, um, so we had Sgt. Pepper's uh, cover by Peter Blake from really, really little. And we only had, like, my dad wasn't really into popular music. So if he went and did a session, like, with Bob Marley or anybody, he'd bring back um, or he'd get an album. So we were limited. So those were with us all our lives. So um, I, I didn't watch um, Monty Python particularly, but I did... I I was going to um, show, I did used to watch a lot of Saturday morning TV and um, uh, there was all stupid stuff on there. So I think, yeah, I think there's that, that stupidness I've got a bit of, yeah. <laughs> But the circus thing, weirdly, I mean, we did have, my sister found them the other day, we did have my grandfather's circus pants from, you know, like big pants, satin with things. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, my family were, like, quite unusual, so I think that just 
but I didn't realize it. I fought against it. I wanted to be modernist. You know, I fought against it for years and years. I, when I was at the Royal College, I wanted to do my type like the smallest, and I used to lose sleep over whether I should do this amount of leading and all this stuff. And then I realized that maybe I'd been trying to force myself into a world that actually wasn't really who I was about. And, you know, and, but I've managed to find that space for myself, which is good. Any other question? I have a question. Um, we feel that there is two aspects in your work. Uh, one is doing these, uh, these colors, type, design, but also there is another aspect is to be with human mm. and to do something with a group of people. Um, it's, it's a stupid question, but does one can live with the other, or does one is better than the other, or does it a surprise and suddenly working with people, it looks to be even better than doing the final piece? You know, when we, we do design, we always think about the process is better mm. than that the end. I, I know that the end is fabulous, I love mm. it, but what you can say about that? No, no, I always like the end. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I've not, that's what I used to find difficult when I was printing, because for me, if I printed something, the proof was the most exciting bit, but I already saw it completely done at that moment, and I really loved it. And then when I got the final thing, I'd already been there. But when I make these big installations, the majority of it is really in my head still, because, you know, I do models and stuff like that, but when you do something in scale and you're walking into it and it's a different thing, then that is absolutely the best feeling. And the process getting to it. I'm, I, I work a lot on the computer, continually drawing things. And, and that can get a bit um, boring. And so it's quite nice to then paint for a bit and have some people in the studio. But the reason I don't employ anybody, because I'm not really very nice, and I wouldn't... I, I couldn't have somebody that I had to keep happy all day. They would be bored and I'd feel guilty all the time. So I think it's much better for me to have found this process where I bring people in when it's interesting for them and it, they'll learn something and I don't have to be worried about whether I'm not doing this or that. And then the rest of the time I can sit with my dog and have Radio 4 on and then just not talk to anybody, um, which I quite like. So. You know, I think it's nice to be able to make your own way, how you, you know, the best way to work for yourself. Any other question? No. Okay, mm -hmm. finished. Mm -hmm. Ah, I thought, oh, I'm just gonna hide then. Uh, hi, first of all, you have a wonderful sense of color. Thank That's you. amazing. But I wanted to know, you do this, um, you are a visual designer, but you're also so good with space, you know, how to construct a space, like an art, almost like a space designer, mm -hmm. like an exhibition designer. How did you have an, a training or d just that comes naturally or? Yeah, I, d I don't know. <laughs> I mean, from, the, from, the, from even St. Martin's, I was designing interior spaces. So, you know, maybe I it should have done architecture or something, but in a way, because I didn't do it, and I don't at all in any way think I'm anywhere near an architect, but I do think that non-architects can also do things in three-dimensional spaces and yeah. it shouldn't be just kept to, to architects. Yeah, because it completely <laughs> breaks, you know, like it's not defined, it's just going everywhere, like he said, like a circus almost, so that's yeah. amazing. But it is quite controlled. I, I'm actually, I'm really controlled and, I, and all my painting and everything has to be absolutely perfect. Luke wants me to do something more expressive, you know. I have to have everything... And that is where I think the design side of me that I can't get rid of. I just like things perfect. I like it completely flat. And I'm very organized. I don't think people think I am. But it's much... Because to make a big structure, you have to jigsaw masses yeah, exactly, and masses of things yeah. together. And I don't have project managers or anything. I do that all myself. And Luke does work with me, but he, um, he doesn't do any of that sort of work with me. I do that all. So I have to, I have to provide 
if I'm not painting it myself or everybody painting, we have to work to really rigid uh, organization so nobody gets a color wrong. I did have, I did one project I did, I did have a guy who came and worked for me and as he started work, he told me he's colorblind. <laughs> and I was like, hey, that's not ideal. <laughs> um, so I had to then spend the whole, like a week numbering every single color and then numbering everything on the plan so that I wasn't going to not let him be employed, you know. We done? Yeah. <laughs> Any other question? Yes. Oh, <laughs> Wait. Yes. It's coming. It's all right. Hello. Um, I come from Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, next to Mexico, mm -hmm. <laughs> and we share a lot of things about our cultures. Yeah. And in the last few years, I think uh, Latin America country, um, like we are more uh, proud of mm -hmm. our culture, mm -hmm. and I, I can see how Peruvian, Mexican, Guatemalan uh, have become more stronger in her own graphic culture. But it's a, a process that we just, we are just in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Europe have more uh, time to understand her own culture to could um, design it. So uh, my question is, <laughs> with that background, uh, what do you think about uh, these countries like Mexico, that Mexico have a exquisite and really a rich uh, popular culture. If you go to uh, Mexico City, you could see a lot of things in the market, in the street, uh, in, in the cars. Uh, so what do you think about this kind of uh, Latin uh, cultures? And how could you uh, take that in your own work? Because I saw the cars in Thailand, I think. The which, sorry? I saw a cars in a picture. The cars in India. In India. So yeah. uh, and, and I realized that, that in Latin America we have some kind of stuff like that. How, how do you take that inspiration and put in your own well, work? Well, uh, I think it's dangerous to culturally appropriate. So I'd, I would try not to, you know, what was weird about the piece in Mexico City, I didn't really, I'd never been to Mexico. I knew, you know, I'd collected certain things, but. Um, and then, of, then when it got there, it looked Aztec, and I didn't really, I, I had no idea, but it had that sort of sense of Aztec. Oh. What I, I only know Mexico a little bit, and what I understood about Mexico is that um, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera spent a really long time to try and save the crafts in Mexico. So actually, the Mexican crafts are quite, you know, are strong and thriving, and What's great about the people that I'm working, I worked with, they're young architects, all in their early 30s and stuff. They are really enhancing a new language of um, uh, design and architecture that's actually embracing the, the culture. In, inherited culture. What I found when I went to speak in India recently, it was quite the opposite, where all these young people f wanted to do everything in grey and minimal and because they thought that poor people used colour and it was cheap exactly. and it was unsophisticated. Yeah. The same in other countries. Yeah, and, and actually, uh, but they were in, they, but they love my work, which was really, so, so I said, well, then you've, you know, you've got, to, you've got to grab your culture now. It's a time for you to grab your culture. And that is happening. When I went to Africa, there's future Africa. And that is happening in Africa. But all the other cultures have to grab their cultures and make it their, you know, their, their own it and own it now and not just own it from the past and doing craft, but actually take it somewhere else. And, and I hope that showing the colour, you know, you can be crazy with colour and hopefully it still looks okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Last question, maybe? No. No? Done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
peine 14 ans après sa création, l'iconique école de design du Bauhaus fut fermée par le régime nazi. De nombreux trésors et chefs-d'œuvre inachevés y furent abandonnés, cachés aux yeux du monde. Reposant sur l'idée de former une nouvelle génération d'artistes pour créer un monde meilleur, le Bauhaus a jeté les bases du design moderne tel que nous le connaissons aujourd'hui, changeant à jamais la créativité. Dans l'Allemagne des années 1930, toutefois, les idées progressistes du Bauhaus étaient considérées comme une menace, rendant inéluctable la fermeture de l'école. Mais parfois, ce qui a été oublié avec le temps peut renaître à tout moment. de Bose est toujours aussi puissante. À partir de maintenant, vous pouvez créer avec un morceau d'histoire. Composition going on. 